All right, hey everybody. Um, so I, my name is Adin. Uh, I work uh, with MPL on IPFS stu and, and stewardship. Um, this talks about some, op it's, it's called open problems and alignment, but it's sort of misnamed in the sense that I'm a person, I have an opinion. You, have, you are also people, you have other opinions. So this is not trying to get alignment as much as trying to raise points that we can then discuss and align on later, right? The talk does not give alignment, it gives discussion, it lets us get alignment. So a couple of points that I wanted to flag, some of which Juan has already talked about, which means I get to speed through them. Uh, there are requirements, there's different types of requirements in terms of what is it a client will need, right? Uh, okay, if I need it to be under half a second or something, this is fine, everything we do already does this. Even a couple hundred milliseconds, we can do this. If I need like 20 milliseconds, I need to be closer to the end user, right? This, we, we need this, um, which means, you know, speed of light only does so much, so you, you gotta figure something out. Um, two other problems that I wanted to, to point out a little bit are like incentivization and spam. So incentivization means like who, and, who is storing and serving all of these records and why? And spam is like how do I know which records I want? And in particular, think of spam a little bit as like the content routing problem, if I could like extend on it maybe a little bit, is like there is on the other half of the content routing a data transfer protocol request. And if the data transfer protocol request and I have a choice between five peers and one of them is in Australia and the other is in Iceland, I better choose the one in Iceland or like I'm going to be back in like, you know, five second land, right, waiting for the, the connection. Okay, so... Some, some, like, some like basic napkin math, right, that we already went through, like there's lots of petabytes of data, you can divide them, even if you take like the IPFS public DHT with 40,000 nodes and you divide it up, you're still getting like, everybody has to store like many, like tens of terabytes of data, right? It's, it's like too much for that kind of system. And it's gonna cost, you know, and it's gonna cost a bunch of money to run this system. Maybe you distribute it over enough people, it turns out it's small enough, but like these are, there's like actual amounts of cost associated with running a system that stores 10 to the 15 or more CIDs that we have to worry about. There's lots of ways to do this. You could do public goods. Uh, you could do public goods and everyone can, you have lots of people, they'll donate a little bit. Okay, well now we'll have lots of people in lots of different places and now maybe I start running into that whole like, they're all over the internet problem again. Uh, you could switch it around, you could have the cost borne by the utilizers of the system so that when someone does a put or a get operation, they are the ones paying for it, whether directly or indirectly. And that would cover it. To some extent, this is how DNS operates, right? Um, you, you pay a DNS provider to like make all the magic happen. Uh, and there are other ways to try and incentivize participation, right? In a sense, this is like blockchains are in this business of how do I incentivize the existence of like a, a shared good that lets us get this thing to go. Um, again, if we look at the IPFS public DHT, the issues, in my opinion, around some of the DHT stuff are not so much on like the, the latency retrieval side, because you can actually get it down, if you ignore some of the like, even if it was only a single hop, that pair might be in Australia, and you say it's okay because you have replication factors that move them into your country, because your replication factor is high enough. Your problem is like, these 40, 160 terabytes per server, right? And like, who's running these servers? And if all the data is coming from like pinning services and Filecoin SPs and retrieval markets, why is my desktop storing their data for free for them? Like they have, they have the resources, they have the drive. Like this doesn't, this doesn't add up, which is part of the reason why we need like something else. Um, okay, what happens when you lie? What happens when a content routing system lies about the stuff that it gets? And what does it mean to lie? So you could get, I could give you bad results. I could give you garbage. I could not give you some good results. Um, if I give you bad results, I waste your time. Maybe make it impossible to find the content and I end up censoring it. If I don't give you good results, I could be the same deal, right? I've, I've dosed you. Or maybe I've just made it more expensive for you because you know that Google homepage? There's only one guy who has it. He's gonna, it's gonna be 100 bucks for the homepage. Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. 
And as a, as a consumer of this routing system that's doing the lying, what are you gonna do about it? So you can say like, oh, you know, that Adin guy, not asking him for more routing requests, he seems very fishy. Uh, or you could say, oh, you know what, fine, I'll ask him, but I will ask someone nice and reputable like, like Steve. Uh, and that, that will probably even out. But this requires more work on behalf of the client, which they may or may not be willing to do. That, like, that may be something that they just, they cannot afford to make it happen. They, they don't run long-lived processes, so they can't accumulate their own reputation. And they can't afford to make multiple queries because writing multiple queries is expensive for them. You know, and even when we talk about performance, like, like whose performance and, and for what, right? There may be different types of this. So like there's the extreme example, which is like, there's one side of this, which is like the Twitter thing that one mentioned, which is like I have, I need to get like, you know, a kilobyte of data really fast. And if you make me wait like two seconds for a kilobyte of data, I'm gonna strangle you, all right? And there's the other, which is, I am downloading 100 gigabytes of data, and if you make me wait 30 seconds for a routing request, I almost certainly don't care if you give me enough peers that it will actually download faster, because I just want to get the data, and time to first byte is not what drives me. Um, how much do I care about the puts? Right? We talked a lot about the gets. When I do a put, how long does it need to take to show up? Uh, when I do an update, when I, whether the update is like, I no longer have this content, please stop bothering me. Or I've changed my network address, I now live over here. How long does that need to, how long of a propagation is acceptable, right? Um, these are like pieces to consider as part of the systems that we're building. All right, so spam. Um, there, when people think about Kademlia and spam things, they tend to think of like civil attacks and attacking the network and the shape of the network and, and that kind of thing. This is not that. This is the fact, this is simply the fact that we in the business of provider records have this problem, which is that our CIDs help us verify the content, and that is cool. And we have public keys that can help us, you know, talk to you know other nodes securely, and that is fine. But when I go talk to them, how do I know they're, how do I know they have the stuff I want or that they're the right person at all? They advertised an IP address to me, but it's an IPv4 address and it could be from anyone on the planet because there's no certificate validating that it's theirs. Um, and, and even if your routing system is totally honest and just trying to do its best here, how can it help you solve these problems? Uh, how can it help me figure out, you know, to, which of, which of the peers that I'm getting, right, are gonna be close by to me, and I should try them first. Who has, who has high bandwidth? Um, there's authorization things. Like, I, I know because of some of the historical stuff around, like, Kubo's prevalence and, and the way people have been making use of the BitSwap protocol, people don't think a ton about how you could use these things to do like authorization, just be like, nope, you don't get access to this. Even though that's been a part of like, a thing you could do in the BitSwap protocol since like day one, because it's associated with peer IDs. Um, but it's true, like I could advertise data and be like, it is only for people whose names start with A. And, and now what, right? You're routing, like I, as a client, I would like to make sure I do not go and ask someone for that data if they're not gonna give it to me because now I'm just wasting resources I may not have. Um, and then of course, this, this, <laughs> this uh, amplification attack against other people on the network where I can say, yep, uh, my name is Adin, I have this IP address. Also, it's the address of, uh, of Gus's home server. Also try there. Yeah, it's totally not gonna DOS him, it's gonna be fine. Um, okay, so, so like hard mode, right? What is like the, the hard mode, what is one of the hard modes of this problem? I need like everything in under 10 milliseconds. The provider records have to have more information than we have, certainly more than the IPFS public DHT has, which is like, guy exists, here is peer ID, see elsewhere for addresses. Um, but like significantly more information such that I, as a client, can figure out how to prioritize them. Um, all, the all the ones that, you know, all the bad ones have been removed. 
bad, being bad for me, the client who has asked for them, or at least so that I can self-filter them. And all of the valid ones should be available. And valid um, is, is, is not being sp specifically defined, right? Uh, as one mentioned earlier, you don't have to store all the records everywhere. You have to store all the ones that are valid for your system, all the ones those that are available. And then you're like, oh, also I want it to be, I want everything to be free. I want, I want advertising to be free. I want discovery to be free. I want this all to just work so people can just show up and use it and they don't have to sign up with anything uh, or, or get any tokens. And also somehow this free should not turn into a web two free where we make it violate your privacy issues that makes all of the talks tomorrow impossible because your incentivization scheme has focused on you know, spying on people's data. Right, so you don't you don't get to cheat like that because we're trying to avoid some of the, the web two things, uh, and also it needs to be not just ten to the fifteen CIDs, but also that they need to be you know retrievable from like billions of devices. This is the hard mode thing. I don't think we need to do all of the hard mode things, um, and a bunch of the talks that you have heard, some I think that you will hear, um, talk about. Areas that we can improve that are not specifically solving all of the hard problems here, or even more than a couple of them, but are also focused on like making our implementations able to solve, able to solve the easy problems that are not these, but like enable enable parts of this this scheme to work. Um, so to try and condense where we were at as we were flying through this. Uh, there's a lot of hard problems here. It will likely not be one size fits all. One of the reasons why this like reframe API thing was designed was to try and make something for people to work against as they start building composable systems in order to make the one size that, you know, if it's not one size fits all, and there are many of them, it would be nice if I could figure out how to like glue them together and leverage the fact that content addressing, unlike Location addressing means like I have many options, right? Like the fact that we have strength in self-certifiable data means that our routing system can be worse than the like location addressing routing system, right? This is like our superpower that we get to use. Um, and so we need like reasonable ways for developers to work with these things. Um, and then the high level questions, how much is gonna cost to keep the system running? Who's going to foot the bill? Why are they going to foot the bill? Um, speed. What's the what's the model for your particular chunk of this routing ecosystem that you are trying to meet? Right. It's not going to be the same for everyone. The same way that not all data storage is equal in terms of how retrievable in terms of like the retrieval latencies on it. Right. There are reasons why there is hot storage and cold storage. Um, and enabling fast retrieval for the clients, right? The, the content routing problem doesn't stop at giving me a pile of CIDs or CIDs and multi-addresses. It stops when you can tell me, the client, how to figure out where to dial. Because even if you shove all of the content routing records, in the, all 10 to the you know, 15 of them, into like you know, every five blocks, there's another one of these servers. If what they do is they give me a list of records and the guy I need to get is in Australia, I've lost again, right? Um, I, as the client, need to be able to figure out how to get the data quickly because otherwise, when I try and add my numbers up so that my actual bytes on my machine is under half a second or 300 milliseconds, I'm gonna be like, great, content routing, 20 milliseconds, done. And then you're gonna be like, oh no, my data transfer, it's taking me 400 milliseconds. Except it's not gonna be the data transfer protocol's fault. It's not gonna be the content routing system's fault. It's gonna be this piece in the middle that you dropped, which is the content routing system needs to know who to go, the, the data transfer system needs to know who to go ask. And that's all. Thank you. I think I kept it. Oh, okay.